just want to let everyone know that there is this is going to be recorded and it will be put out to YouTube, Facebook, and a number of different uh, platforms, as well as Cambridge Health Alliance. My name is Roberta Robinson. I'm a marketing manager for Geriatrics. And today we have a, our monthly Lunch and Learn. Thank you for joining us. I also want to do a little housekeeping. If everyone could mute themselves, um, that would be great. You can put your questions in the chat. That would be perfect as well. And um, I just wanted to also welcome Saludis Vida, which is a, a live Hispanic Facebook group. So welcome to them, Benvenido. And um, I guess that's it. So today we're excited to have Dr. Laura Sullivan and Matt Olian, who is a pharmacist, uh, talking about um, LGBT, uh, their needs uh, inadequacies, and shine some light on on uh, things we need to know. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So Matt, you have the floor. Great. All right. And shout out to Matt, who, who uh, uh, did the bulk of this presentation. So nice job, Matt. Thank you. Um, so my name is Matthew. I am a clinical pharmacy specialist here at Cambridge Health Alliance. And today me and Dr. Sullivan are going to be talking about LGBTQ plus health. To start off, I have no financial or otherwise relevant disclosures to report. And it is my hope that by the end of this presentation, we'll be able to create a level of cultural competency for the LGBTQ plus population, as well as recognize some unique health inequities that they face. I also want to be able to familiarize you with some various resources for LGBTQ class patients available through both CHA, Massachusetts, and other local organizations. To start off, we're going to start with a little video. Um, and this is to more highlight the experience that some uh, uh, gender minority and sexual minority patients can experience in the healthcare setting. A few years ago, I was diagnosed with polycystic ovary syndrome. And um, the doctors who treated me wanted to treat me as if I was a cisgendered woman who wanted to have kids and didn't really take into account that that's not necessarily the way I identified or what I wanted. Early on after coming out, I had a negative experience um, actually during my first pap smear. In the middle of it, started asking me questions about my sexuality and then giving me quite a, a lecture um, about morals and about what was right and wrong to do with sex and uh, about letting down my parents, uh, all in the middle of the procedure, which was a, a really sort of traumatic experience. Just after I was um, received my positive diagnosis for HIV, um, I sought the services of a clinic in Melbourne. Basically, the assumption was made that I was just a night and basically made the choice of having unprotected sex when actually the case was I was sexually assaulted and that's how I came out with HIV. When I came out I had a lot of issues with my family and them accepting that um, which led to a few years being estranged with my mother in particular and um, to rebuild that relationship we had a few mediated sessions with a the therapist and those sessions became about um, how I'd left my mother in the dark and how I'd done wrong by her. I ended up in a adult psychiatric ward where the doctors um, all refused to acknowledge me as trans and used the wrong pronouns like, deliberately. I've never had a good experience in healthcare. It made me feel like I couldn't trust doctors. It made me feel like I had to very much bury who I am and just pretend to be normal, I guess. This experience made me feel really vulnerable and not safe in my vulnerability. This experience made me feel dehumanized, made me feel like I wasn't worth as much as other patients. I've had one really good experience with a neurologist that I saw. Uh, she noticed that I'd ticked Mr. on the box, uh, but my doctor had put the referral as female. And so she actually spoke to me sort of briefly about that and just asked what pronouns I prefer. And when she then had to write a letter again, 
she checked what I wanted to actually have on it. And that was fantastic. Uh, I had a good experience with a GP who wasn't phased in any way, you know, didn't blink, didn't act uncomfortable or awkward uh, as soon as I mentioned my partner. And from the beginning, I felt that she understood that I was in a same-sex relationship, that it wasn't particularly relevant to the issue that I'd come there for, but if it did come up, it was something that could come up very easily and comfortably. Come across a dental practice and they're really caring, they know I have HIV, um, and they're just very gentle and very considerate. My message to help. All right. And so I chose to highlight that video um, because I believe it, it shows a really good summary of some of the experiences that people can have in healthcare and the power that healthcare providers and staff have to have an impact, both positive and negative. To start off, we're gonna talk about LGBTQ plus background. L the term LGBTQ plus is an umbrella term for sexuality and gender minorities. Um, I've listed some of the more common terms here, but I also wanted to show a visual of the gender unicorn um, because it really does highlight some of the differences in inward and outward gender expression, uh, the sex assigned at birth, as well as the physical and emotional attraction that a person may feel. And these can all range from zero to 100. And so it's, you could have any combination of any of these that makes you you. Because it's a uh, umbrella term, sometimes sexuality and gender do get interchanged, but it's important to know that sexuality does not imply gender and vice versa. Gender is more in a definition of a societal construct where it's the, drain, the range of characteristics pertaining to and differentiating between femininity and masculinity. Whereas sexuality is the way that people experience and express themselves sexually. I also included the term cisgender and transgender Cisgender is a gender identity that matches the sex assigned at birth, whereas transgender is a gender identity that does not match the sex assigned at birth. Pronouns can be really important in this community as a way to help identify. I've listed some of the more common ones here, but it's good to note that a person may choose to identify with some, all, or even none of these. Um, I do get asked a lot, well, what do I do if I make a mistake and I I accidentally say a, a pronoun that was incorrect. I don't want to offend them. And that's okay. We're all human. Every mistakes happen. The important part is that we recognize the mistake and we try to fix it in the future. Some helpful tips that I can provide would be always ask, don't assume. And you can always share your own pronouns as well. When in doubt, use gender, gender neutral pronouns such as they, them, theirs, or sibling versus brother or sister or hey all or hey y'all versus hey guys. I've also listed some outdated, inaccurate, or potentially offensive gender identity terms here. Some people may choose to self-identify with something on this list, but it's more of a way to take the power back from somebody who has taken it from them originally. So unless specifically if they've said that they wanna identify this way, I would avoid these terms. Next, I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the civil rights movement for uh, queer and gay people. Uh, this all happened in the 60s where it really sparked. So back in the 60s, homosexual acts were all illegal except for in the state of Illinois. Because of this, uh, a lot of the places where uh, gay and queer people would be able to meet would only be bars. But unfortunately, these bars uh, uh, made it illegal to serve queer people. And so a lot of these were functioning under the table illegally or even run through the mafia. Um, one specific bar, which was the Stonewall Inn was a very popular gay bar in the New York City. Um, and in 1969, what happened was there was a lot of undercover cops that came in and started arresting queer people, taking them out of the bar and a riot ensued. Um, that really sparked the civil rights movement for the queer, uh, queer people and, and LGBTQ plus population. I've, list, I've shown a couple of the more, um, more well-known organizations like the Gay Liberation Front. And here are two of the uh, more notable figures, which are Marsha P. Johnson and uh, Sylvia Rivera. They are both notable drag queens in New York City. And they really are responsible for the liberation movement itself. Um, as well as forming uh, multiple organizations for transgender individuals. 
the uh, the movement was a very long, slow process, and uh, it wasn't until 1986 that United the United States actually decriminalized homosexual activity. And in the military, it's been banned uh, up until 2010, where the "Don't Ask, Don't Tell" uh, was in effect, where uh, thousands of, of military individuals were discharged dishonorably because of being queer. I also included this timeline to show that over decades of progress, we're just now getting to the point where we have marriage equality in 2015. So this is all very new. Luckily, the support for same-sex marriage has drastically improved. From 1997, 27% had uh, approved up until 70% now, and that likely will continue to improve. One of the reasons why that is, is because more and more people are starting to self-identify as LGBTQ, especially the younger generations. These are now uh, generations who are more likely to identify versus their older counterparts. But we'll start to see this more and more and more as younger generations become, uh, become starting to get to the forefront. In most countries, uh, homosexual activity is legal. However, there are a couple countries that it is illegal and even some where the death penalty is uh, still valid. Um, even though we are a green country, meaning homosexual activity is legal, all states are not created equal. You can consider this like a uh, report card for each state. Green would mean you have a high overall policy tally and red meaning you have a negative overall policy tally. This ties very closely into the anti-LGBTQ plus bills that have been introduced to this legislative session, 168 of which are still alive. Um, some of the more notable ones include the Don't Say Gay bill and the Youth Transgender bill in Texas. Um, I've included a link to this anti-transgender legislation track uh, tracker. So if you have any questions or any uh, concern, you can always go here and track them. Um, luckily for the state of Massachusetts, we exist in a 100% coverage state for sexual orientation, gender identity, and conversion therapy. A quick note on conversion therapy, it is a, a range of dangerous and discredited practices that falsely uh, attempt to change a person's sexual orientation or gender identity or expression. It was popularized back in the 70s when the civil rights movement really started and included a lot of inhumane practices such as institutionalization, castration, and shock therapy. Despite its controversy, it's still in use today, um, despite there being no medical evidence to support its use, and it's been condemned by all the leading medical and mental health associations. Next, I wanted to touch base on health inequities. A health inequity is a systematic difference in the health status of different populations or groups, leading to both social and economic costs to both individuals and societies. I, can, I illustrated here with this visual the difference between equality and equity. As equality gives everyone the same, it may not be enough for those who need it the most. Whereas equity gives more to people who need it, so everyone has an equal opportunity. Some specific health inequities that exist within the community include access to care and mental health, which are the ones that we'll be focusing on today. But there are a number of other health inequities that I've listed here for the sake of time we won't be able to get into. The LGBT population overall has higher poverty rates, higher uninsurement rates, and higher unemployment rates than the heterosexual population. Lesbian women specifically are less likely to receive mammograms or pap smears. And when looking at transgender patients, they have a higher rate of uninsured status versus their LGB counterparts. And in one study, 50% of transgender patients reported to have injected hormones through illegal means or outside of traditional medical setting. Why does that happen? Why is, why is that number so high? Well, the Center for American Progress came out with a study in 2020 to look at some of these inequities. The results were pretty astounding. And I've listed more of the, uh, the important ones here Specifically, though, the 30% of the LGBTQ population and greater than 50% of the trans population had faced difficulty accessing care due to cost. 15% and 30% respectively uh, had postponed medical treatment due to discrimination. And 30% of the trans population 
had to actually teach their own doctor about transgender individuals in order to receive care. The survey also looked at unique barriers that transgender Americans face, and the results were also very significant, including those that the doctor was physically uncomfortable, intentionally misgendering, refusing to give care, or even being physically rough or abusive. Unfortunately, with these transgender results, if uh, you were a transgender person of color, these results were only amplified further. And these did carry over into health insurance discrimination as well. The, there is some progress being made in this front, but it is still something that needs to be noted. And lastly, talking about mental health. So the Massachusetts Department of Public Health came out with a survey from 2009 that looked at the types of people who would be considered attempting suicide. And as you can see here, um, both uh, heterosexual came at 2.3%. And then as you started getting to these gender and sexual minorities, it really started to increase um, with transgender patients having 30% responded as having considered attempting suicide in the past. Overall, to their, this population is two times more likely to have a mental health disorder in their lifetime and two and a half times more likely to experience depression and anxiety. The pandemic has unfortunately amplified this inequity and we're going to be seeing the results from this as the coming years progress. Lastly, I wanted to talk about some specific resources that are available both through Cambridge Health Alliance and through the state of Massachusetts. Cambridge Health Alliance is now designated as a leader in uh, healthcare from the Healthcare, healthcare Equity, Equality Index from the Human Rights Campaign. We do have dedicated gender affirming care and sexuality services, but some other ways that we are committed to the population is by including a welcoming and knowledgeable provider and staff environment, um, having progressive medical chart adaptations and gender neutral bathrooms, as well as giving back to the community. So participating in CHA Pride Months and celebrations and events, as well as having several communities uh, to bolster health equity within the community and to improve the community's experience while at CHA. I've also listed some other CHA wide resources here. Um, there's the CHA specific LGBTQ plus resource page, the Mass Department of Public Health resource page, and the Fenway Health resource page. In conclusion, this community has gone through a lot and the fight is far from over. Um, we face a lot of discrimination, internalized homophobia, transphobia, racism um, from outside the community and even from inside the community. We have an opportunity to use education to uh, teach with kindness and compassion and really help bring our siblings into um, a healthier place for tomorrow. With that being said, I will take any questions that you have along with Dr. Sullivan will be also answering. Thank you. Uh, I was just saying that there was a question about having uh, um, slides available and uh, Lexi answered that they will be put on the, the CHA older adults page. And uh, mostly we're getting accolades for that. We've had some people enter a little bit late. So I wanted to let them know that um, the slides will be available as well. Um, let's see. I think we still have people entering. Uh, so tell us a little more about what gender affirming care we offer at CHA. Dr. Sullivan, do you wanna take that? Yeah, I'll take that. Um, so in fact, we've had a lot of folks who've been interested in uh, supporting folks who don't feel uh, how they don't feel there's a match between uh, what they've been assigned at birth and who they really are. And, and so there are lots of um, pieces to that care. Some of that care involves um, behavioral health. Um, and we've had some uh, clinicians who've, been, who've had expertise in that, in that realm. Uh, we're building that back up. We also have had folks in endocrine or in primary care um, who have helped both by just even listening and seeing the person for who they are um, and walking with them um, to decide, well, do you wanna take hormones? Do you wanna uh, 
think about surgery? What, where are you at in your journey and what would you like? So um, we have some folks at a couple of different sites uh, working on that as individuals, but in CHA, we're also trying to actually link everybody um, such that it's not uh, these little silos, but rather a, a better connected system to deliver this optimal care. Uh, we have a trial at Malden uh, for the gender affirming um, care that, that I know Matt's a part of, uh, which is terrific. Uh, we also have uh, connected with them uh, in endocrine, Melanie Brunt, who's also uh, supporting the endeavor. Uh, Tracy Brooks is uh, assisting in, in PD and Carrie Bambassa Miller also at Windsor, but really trying to connect. And we might even we might even have the pleasure of having a patient navigator to help um, our patients really navigate the system. Because no matter who you are, healthcare systems are really rough to navigate. And wouldn't it be great uh, to deliver that optimal care? The other piece I would like to point out that Matt mentioned, but to raise up, is really trying to make no matter where a patient comes into our system, they feel welcome. Um, and that would be everybody. And given the topic, and our LGBTQIA plus community. Um, uh, whether it be single use bathrooms, should be gender neutral, who cares, right? Um, and, uh, and just things on the wall that invite everybody uh, that they're welcome. Um, super important, thank you. Uh, let's see, a patient navigator will be great. We have some comments here, let's see. Um, uh, Google Sites on Diversity Council, Google Site, they're uh, it put in the chat, basically. Um, at, we have a patient adolescent, a pediatric and adolescent gender affirming care here. Thanks for the shout out, Dr. Sullivan. Um, and that's pretty much I, I, what is in the chat. Uh, again, accolades to Matt. Do you have something else, Dr. Sullivan? Yeah, I just want to acknowledge uh, some of the crew from uh, Malden uh, here, and that's great. Um, uh, and Malden is a family medicine uh, clinic, so all ages uh, also uh, are being uh, helped. I don't know if um, it looks like Beth Ta and Tara and Joanne uh, from Malden are, are there, so if there are any specific questions, um, Certainly, they may be uh, up to the task to responding, but but do know we're we're happy uh, to welcome all. Um, so how many LGBTQ people are currently in the United States, and why is that number increasing? Good question. And um, so it's estimated around twenty million right now. Um, and that's only adults. And I think that there's a number of reasons why that might be increasing. Um, the older generations, are, a lot of stigma existed. And I think that because now that we have these newer generations coming out who are um, more open with their sexuality and gender, we're going to be seeing a lot more of an increase. Um, specifically, uh, I had a slide that showed, you know, the increase from 10 to 20 percent um, when looking at millennial to Gen Z and Gen Alpha, the, the next generation coming up is going to be queerer than that. Um, so it, we're going to see a positive trajectory for sure. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, I, how, do, how do we support the parents and or spouses of the LGBT patients? Yeah. That, that's I mean, yeah, a, a lot of that is, it, it, honestly, it happens everywhere uh, in our primary care settings, quite frankly. We listen, right? We listen. We meet people where they're at. We bring education. We connect folks to resources. That's what we do. Um, that's good uh, patient care and, and seeing folks as humans first, right? Um, and no matter where you go at CHA, I guarantee you'll get folks who will just listen and walk with you, uh, no matter whether you're someone who identifies as trans or LGBTQIA+, or if, if you're a parent or a sibling or a family member or anything, right? Um, uh, that's, that's what we do. Uh, the other thing I was, I was gonna mention to add to what Matt had to say, a couple, couple things. You know, the younger generations as, as over generations have always done, 
is is um they they push us a little further they you know the kids now the the 10 11 12 year olds they're like hey there are some things that are that i identify as female some things are male why do we it it's all within me so why would i label one way or another it's just it's just the the framing you know they're changing the frame uh and how cool is that so that's that's also part of the why and 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 also let's face it these numbers have always been under reported why as matt mentioned internal homophobia um and external look what's happening right now pendulums always swing we've had a lot of positive uh action forward and and as mentioned it, this year we've already had some states go in the other direction, right? Families leaving Texas, families leaving Florida. Not a not a joke, didn't make it up. Look it up. Right. Well, thank you so much. We have comments that thank you for taking the time to make this presentation available. Uh, you're welcome, it's our pleasure. And also uh, comments that it was an excellent presentation. So thank you so much, Dr. Sullivan and Matt for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedules to share this information, shine some light on this subject. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that next month we do the lunch and learn once a month and next month it is May 4th. And uh, Dr. Uh, Shruti Soni, who is a neurologist is gonna come on board and she will be talking about stroke prevention. May is uh, stroke prevention month. So she will be talking about that. And also I did wanna put a plug in for our new event, which is a, um, a game show of all things based on the show, Name That Tune. So um, I will be doing that once a month and it's starting April 13th at 6.30 in the evening so we can hopefully get more people. We'll have prizes, we'll have music, energy will be high. So I hope to see you all there. Thank you once again for um, making your time available and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we'll see you again next month. Thanks Roberta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt and everyone. Thank you for coming on board.